Charles Kane represents a lot of people in American history. The biggest inspiration that director Orson Welles had when he developed Kane as a character was the contemporary newspaperman William Hearst, known for both the early 20th century media phenomena known as yellow journalism, and also for stimulating public opinion against Spain around the same time, and thus provoking American belligerence in Cuba, which is something Kane also does in the movie. You provide the prose poems, I'll provide the war. That's <laughs> fine, Mr. Kane. Yes, I rather like myself. Well, right away. He similarly had the support of one of the most corrupt political organizations in American history. History, New York's Tammany Hall, but in public he was the friend to the working man, running for New York mayorship with running mate James Stokes, one of the founding members of the Intercollegiate Socialist Society. This was also Charles Foster Kane, the fighting liberal, the friend of the working man, the next governor of this state. At a time of great corruption in U.S. politics, figures like Hearst today represent the upper class's desire to use the lower classes to their advantage for the sake of power. Citizen Kane takes this class conflict, masquerading as class collaboration, and transforms it into a personal visual conflict between Charles Kane's desire for power and his surroundings. The entirety of the film represents Kane's rising from rags to riches, then to metaphorical rags once more. Mr. Kane was a man who got everything he wanted and then lost it. And the visual composition of the film reflects that understanding. The whole movie itself is staged as a frame narrative, a literary device painting a story within a story. The outer story is what we get when the film opens, a newspaperman trying to uncover the meaning behind Kane's last word, Rosebud. We don't get into the actuals of Kane himself until later on in the film, when the inner story actually begins and the corresponding framing surrounding Kane ends. Herein, Kane's story opens with Kane in the background, his youth contrasted against the tenseness of contemporary economics. This shot here is one of the most prolific throughout the entirety of the movie, even in the outer story as well. Wells loves to pit ideas against each other through the use of deep space composition, putting two or more things on screen at the same time, thus contrasting one movement against the other, a practice made possible by keeping everything and focus at once, referred to as deep focus. And this is how Wells conveys the idea that Kane's story is a story of Kane's desire for power, and that this results in conflicts versus himself and the world. There's a struggle for power that's taking place in every scene, and it's one not only taking place within the narrative, characters themselves struggling for power, but it's literal as well, contrasting movements on screen struggling against each other for the eye's attention. Obviously that which is bigger and more pronounced has more power visually, and thus more power narratively, because the eyes are going to tend to focus on it more so. In the beginning, Cain here doesn't have much power. His family wields power. Specifically, his mother does, because she's in the foreground, signing papers dealing with Cain's entire future, while his father is in the background powerless. The composition is then repeated here, where Wells reveals his technique to showing the audience who has power. Cain's young, and he's short. He's being looked on by everyone else in the scene. Being in the center of the screen, he has power over the other characters insofar as focus is concerned, but pertaining to the narrative, Cain has no power at all. He's at the mercy of his mother and Mr. Thatcher here to the left. This idea that Kane being both small and looked on by others in the scene relates a sense of powerlessness is used throughout the movie, and it contrasts against Wells' secondary technique for conveying Kane's power, putting him in the foreground and having him look on other people. In the beginning of the film, this is represented by Kane's palace, Xanadu, overlooking a worker and the rest of the estate's surroundings. Off topic, but this is also another reference to Hearst, who actually built his own mansion, but I digress. The manifestation of Kane's ego in this case overshadows Kane's surroundings, and when we finally get to the newspaper shop that Kane owns, Kane as individual again overshadows those around him. You notice that while Thatcher is standing in the foreground in the beginning of the scene, as it progresses, the camera tilts under the two characters, gradually positioning Kane above Thatcher until eventually they stand up and we find Kane now taller than Thatcher, who previously was his guardian and previously, but no longer, wielded power over him. When Kane first enters the newspaper shop, a scene which takes place chronologically before the last one, but within the film is shown later, again, he stands over and against everyone else in the scene, especially this chief editor, whose size is initially rather large in comparison to Kane, but as he approaches, his comparative power diminishes. A moment later, another bottom-up angle shot is used to emphasize the powerlessness of the editor against Kane's wishes as the two talk. You also notice in all of these scenes where Kane stands over people, he's standing really close to them, and along with composition, this character blocking throughout the film is used to illustrate Kane's attempted acquisition of power. You notice in this scene, seen how Kane has surrounded himself with people, and how, again, Kane maintains a central authoritative position throughout the entirety of this sequence, as a matter of fact. And because of this, Kane's not opposing anyone, and no real conflicting force is at play. But once Kane gets back from a trip to Europe, all of this changes. He's still in power, 
but his interests are now his own, represented through a clear central position and a color contrast that distinguishes him from everyone else on screen. This scene begins Wells' use of distance to signify Kane's growth of ego, and thus beginnings of his struggle to maintain his power over others. A clear realignment can be made in Kane's character because now, the woman who he's to marry is the niece of the President of the United States. President's niece, huh? Before he's through, she'll be a president's wife. Signifying Kane's dissatisfaction with his status quo and his desire for more power. This foreshadowed idea that Kane's egoism has begun to take over him is then realized in the following sequence, where an initially close couple, emotionally and physically, becomes distance, Mrs. Kane, a woman paling in comparison to Kane's ego, framed against a statue of what appears to be the Virgin Mary, symbolizing alleged divinity. In the same sequence, Kane's ego is fighting Miss Kane, and from here on out, Kane's ego does much the same. When Susan Alexander, the future Mrs. Kane, is introduced, Kane is again shot looking over her, as his ego now fights to claim her as his own. When Kane's giving a speech for a gubernatorial election, Wells visualizes the mass that is Kane's ego via a big brother-esque poster relating Kane's name. And while it appears Kane wields power because he looks over everyone in the crowds, he's extremely insignificant because the crowds are not only looking on him, but his ego is as well. Kane the individual is in competition with Kane the ego, and clearly the ego overshadows him. It's no mistake that as the camera zooms in, Kane is framed directly against his poster. Once this scene is introduced, the conflict becomes Kane against political boss Jim Geddes, Kane's failure foreshadowed by the shriveling up of his ego against the massively larger Geddes. Going forward, Kane's struggles with the world around him are marked by his size being overshadowed, literally in this scene, and his closeness to others replaced with an unmistakable distance. The defeated Kane now overshadows his once bloated ego, that poster now not overlooking Kane, but blending into the background of failure that Kane as individual must now struggle against. The entirety of this sequence seeks to contrast the initial sequence early on in the film when Leland, this guy, and Kane entered the newspaper shop with ideals of control and grandeur, marked by their closeness. Leland and Kane now standing a good distance apart, in silence, denotes the isolation that is created by Kane's ego. The discussion now, as opposed to a bright future, turns to the demagogue that the prospect of such a future has turned Kane into. You talk about the people as though you own them, as though they belong to you. Goodness. Distance is used again in framing the new Mrs. Kane and the struggles that many are going through to see her stage productions follow through. The complexity framed within this wide shot relates to the confusion that Kane's ego has now taken on and how he's displaced this personal confusion onto Mrs. Kane making her a prize of sorts, something that he personally can wield power over and fix. Wells makes this concrete first, as Kane the Overlooker peers on the lessons he's paid for and makes an intervention when they aren't up to his standards, and in the most famous scene from the movie, where Kane claps for his wife after her admittedly bad stage performance. He's again blocked with distance from the surrounding actors and maintains center stage, his isolation conveyed in the following shot through a bare background and a top-down angle. His struggle in regards to the opera now is one against public opinion. Kane's belief that he personally can shape society, manifested in his affairs with the opera, has overtaken him by this point, leading to a clear struggle between himself and Mrs. Kane about his personal aggrandizement, when he makes completely clear, My reasons satisfy me, Susan! You seem unable to understand them. I will not tell them to you again. That he is in control. You will continue with your singing. After Mrs. Kane tries to take back control through a suicide attempt, Wells transitions into the final repercussions of Kane's desire for control and power. Ultimate personal isolation through the taking of his ego to extremes, Xanadu. The first shot we see of Kane during this final portion of the film, articulating his complete destruction, displays him as a decrepit, feeble force seeking to maintain his control through material possessions, his often remarked on statue collection consisting in this scene of pharaohs. The wideness of Kane's ego is further articulated through the panning that Wells employs, making clear the sheer distance that needs to be traversed just so Kane can talk to his wife clearly. As the shot ends, Kane is once more framed in the background, just as solid, cold, and lifeless as the statues framed beside him. A parallel to this earlier shot evoking the beginnings of Kane's demise, here we see how Kane, the individual, has become completely overtaken by and enveloped in his desire for power. Not only has this further distanced him from Susan, but compared to the complexity surrounding her, it's left him personally barren and little more than a commanding, power-hungry force. Fine. 
tents. Who wants to sleep in tents when they got a nice room of their own, with their own bath, where they know where everything is? Distance is then inverted in the following scene where Kane's use of tents to signify an attempt by him to physically bring himself and Susan together, but therein, he continues to stand over and dominate her. He seeks this domination a final time when Susan leaves him, and the framing from prior is continually in place to relate that he maintains control, because in his own mind, he does. Despite this, Susan leaves Kane in his world of power, just as his previous wife and the whole of public opinion did before him, despite her in this scene being in a compositionally low position of power. This break in composition reflecting narrative power is highly significant to Kane's psychology, and the resulting breakdown that he experiences in the following sequence is its manifestation. The final shot of Kane we see in the movie shows him as insignificant as ever, surrounded by both people and his material possessions, but distant and isolated, still believing himself in some sense to be the god who built the Eden that surrounds him. The story of Charles Kane is a story of demagoguery and how Western society, in its inability to provide true comfort, and in its recommendation that we pursue power and wealth to compensate for society's own failures, makes demagogues all the more possible. Despite conflicts between himself, society, and his ego, Kane was able to transform a newspaper shop into a bustling national economic empire. Despite the very same, William Hearst was able to do the very same. Despite a balking conservative force down south, political magnate Huey Long, with speeches just as fiery as Keynes, was elected governor of Louisiana with plans for the presidency, running on a platform promoting a universal basic income, completely socializing most of the United States economy. Chicago Tribune owner Robert McCormick vehemently tried to dissuade the public from support of President Roosevelt's New Deal, and Irene DuPont and John Davis, one-time Democratic candidate for president, then senior attorney for J.P. Morgan, joined forces with numerous other industrialists to overthrow President Roosevelt and institute a corporate puppet state. Need I even mention the present state of U.S. politics, filled with lofty personalities that have manipulated public opinion into believing their Panacean policies? Citizen Kane reminds us that the demagogue is not only internally weak, but constantly at conflict with himself and with the world, constantly desiring that which he cannot have, and filling a void in hopes of achieving it. This is Mr. Amazing. Thanks for watching.